Lalita ji, exactly. So she was the most popular character back then. Back then, and uh, H well again being one of those stalwarts in you know creating good communications and ads. This ad was a very very renowned ad back then, and there were series of ads that H well generated in terms of Lalita ji doing tennis, you know, and you you can Google it essentially. Yeah. Will you do the yeah. So guys, I'll uh, just take you through what is FMCG exactly. So how many of you are interested in applying for FMCG sector? So I know my target audience. Okay, a big number of people. So just to uh, let you know what exactly do we mean by FMCG. So FMCG stands for fast moving consumer goods. So any kind of uh, uh, consumer good which is uh, bought on a repeated purchase basis. For example, when you wake up in the morning, you use, you use toothpaste. When you bathe, you use a bathing bar, you use cleansing products. So all such kind of products are defined as FMCG. So repeated purchase, uh, it's a big uh, factor for defining a product as FMCG. Uh, also relatively, it's a low cost product. So for example, Apple iPhone. So now it's also a repeat purchase. So anyone who bought Apple for iPhone 4, he also buys 5. But that is not considered to be a FMCG product uh, because it's a very high price product. So low price and repeated purchase. So these are the two elements which uh, define a FMCG product. So let's have the next slide. So basically, uh, we divide the whole FMCG category into four segments. So the first segment is personal care. Uh, within personal care, we have three sub-functions. Uh, so the first one is skin. So all the products related to skin, whether it is, say, a bathing bar or a skin cream, say, a sunscreen uh, cream, which you use, uh, it comes under the section of personal care. Uh, the second big section we have within personal care is oral. So, uh, for example, toothpaste, uh, everything related to oral hygiene, it comes under oral subcategory. Uh, there is a third big division, uh, the hair care category. So, all the shampoos, all the uh, conditioners, anything related to conditioning, uh, conditioning your hair, it comes under the subcategory of hair. Uh, we have a next big category, which is foods. So uh, within Unilever, we have few big brands like Knorr. Uh, in India, it's a big category. Companies like ITC, Cadbury, they are going uh, big into foods category. The third major category within Unilever is refreshments. So as everyone is aware about the brands Magnum and Quality Walls. So these are the two major brands uh, which we have. And the last and one of the biggest uh, segment in a FMCG is home care. So all the uh, products related to laundry and home cleaning, for example, floor cleaners, uh, you have a big brand called uh, Surf Excel, which is dirt is good. So this segment is known as home care segment. So we have these four segments and these four segments defined FMCG. Quick question.
question where I asked, you know, what HOL is known for? And I give the answer as brands, right? Now, can someone stand up here and say, tell me, what is a brand? You know, we've often heard this word so many times. This brand, that brand. But essentially, what is a brand? Do it. There's no exam here. Nothing's right, nothing's wrong. Whatever comes to your mind. I don't know the exact formal definition, but I can try in a different manner. So uh, it might be defined as kind of perception what comes to your mind just seeing a product in front of you. So like say, for example, if I am observing Pepsi, then a particular picture comes into my mind. And if I am observing Kingfisher bottle, then a different picture comes into my mind. So kind of. Yeah. Almost there. Any, any more thoughts? Yeah. A reliable product. Basically, uh, you can say a personification of a product. Like uh, when you see a detergent, the only thing that uh, you call it in a day-to-day -day language is surf. That way. Essentially, everything that was said here was correct in some form or the other. A simple definition of brand is nothing but a promise. You know, the word promise itself is close to about the word brand. When, you, when someone sells your brand, or some brand comes to you, it comes with a promise. And that promise could be anything. You know, essentially when I, I, I am standing here, there is a brand here standing before you. I, I, I call myself an extrovert. I, 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 you know, I hold myself in very high integrity. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a person who loves chat, chatting to people. And that's my brand. And similarly, you associate everything what you see and yeah. you buy every day in the market to a brand. When you buy a product in market next time, I, iPhone, and you know, iPhone is the buzzword here, right? Uh, all the time you keep on it. What does an iPhone stand for? iPhone actually stands for an experience. Yeah? iPhone, the first iPhone, uh, those of you who, who know iPhone 3, 3G it was, right? Did even have Bluetooth. Yeah? So did it stand for the latest technology? No, it did not. But it stood for, for, for an experience. People still went ahead and bought it, even though it didn't have the Bluetooth. So it's all about that. It's all about the promise. It's all about the elements that some, some person, some brands promises and then delivers. And then you subsequently go and buy it again. All right. Now, this is what the segmentation is. Tushar, do you want to continue? So just to give you a quick glimpse of uh, how does the FMCG market stands in India, it's a big market. It's almost 2% of the total India's GDP, uh, growing at a very healthy rate of 10 to 12%. Uh, so just to tell you about the relevance of this market, even if you see the crisis of 2008, most of the sectors in India, they crunched, but FMCG is one of the sector uh, which didn't face much heat because of the economic crisis. One of the reasons for this is uh, whatever FMCG products you use, the demand is a need. For example, you use a toothpaste, so you will continue using a toothpaste. But car, for an example, uh, it's not a need. It's not a human need. So it's a more stable sector compared to anything else, FMCG specifically. Uh, talking about the top market players in India, we have four or five major players. So HUL, uh, uh, specifically in India, it's like one of the biggest FMCG companies. So we have many others. Uh, I'll just talk about each one of them in brief. So next slide, please. Uh, so talking about Unilever, uh, as I told you, it's a 28,000 crore company now, uh, one of the India's biggest FMCG. So we have around 35 top brands uh, doing very well in each and every segment. Next slide. Uh, so one of the biggest competitors of Unilever globally is PNG. Uh, so I think PNG is one of the biggest global uh, FMCG company, but specifically in India, they are quite big in the uh, home and personal care segment. So they are doing quite well in uh, laundry products like Ariel. You can see Tide. So you must remember the uh, identity of whiteness which they created using Tide. So doing quite well. Uh, 
the next uh, Indian company uh, is ITC. So it's it's like born and brought up in India only. It's a total Indian company with headquarters in Kolkata. So basically, uh, it's a cigarette company. So most of the revenue still uh, come from uh, cigarette selling. But uh, if you see the market uh, scenario now, so with the increase in uh, price in cigarettes, the volumes are declining. So uh, the strategy of ITC is to uh, pitch it into other segments. For example, they want to make their uh, personal care industry quite big. In foods, they are quite big. Uh, so they started diversifying around 10 years before, thinking that uh, cigarette business might come down uh, in coming future. And they're doing quite well. So already a 10,000 crore company in non-cigarette business, they're doing quite well. Uh, the next uh, big company uh, is Nestle. So uh, you have already like uh, used Nestle products. Nescafe is one of them. Uh, we heard the case about Maggi recently. So again, a big FMCG firm in India. So Amul. So something something is very uh, unique about Amul. It's a cooperative. Uh, it doesn't run like a company. So the sourcing model which Amul uses uh, is like uh, they take the milk from cooperatives. So uh, there are groups of women in villages which goes and they sell the milk at a particular price uh, to the industry. So they have a very supply chain model uh, which is very, very different from any other industry. So uh, I'll just give you one example. So even Unilever. So uh, Unilever tries to uh, like uh, make ice creams which are fully milk based. But they're not able to do that because sourcing of milk, it's a very difficult thing. It's a perishable product. So you cannot store milk more than two, three days uh, without pasteurizing it. So it has a very unique supply chain model, Amul. And again, it's an Indian company which was born because of the white revolution in India. Any questions until now? Anything, anything that comes to your mind you wanted to know so far? Uh, do you want to know about any, any other FMCG industry? Uh, for example, HUL, ITC, these are very similar kind of industries. But uh, maybe the food industries like Cadbury, Nestle are quite different. So any particular qu uh, questions for companies other than Unilever also, we are happy to answer. What do you people actually do there in the company? Yeah, we will cover that maybe now, towards the end. That element come, will come. What we'll do now is... Over. So it was mentioned in the presentation that you have uh, still a lot of uh, unrealized potential. So what is that? See, we, uh, we started the presentation with a you know lovely video of Lalita ji, and then fo you know followed a different you know uh, what a video of hundreds of brands coming across in together. But did you realize that all that is possible in a video form? And why I'm using the word video? It's basically communication, a basically a communication that can reach eyes of people. Uh, in India, still there is a large chunk of population which is media dark. Yeah where the, the logistical reach is, you know, not very much possible. Well, it's possible, but very difficult, let me use that word. Yeah? So this, that, that, is, that is the key reason why it's untamed. So you, you will have loads of villages where still, even company like Unilever or HUL, which is known for its logistics, you know, and the reach that it has, struggles to reach. In fact, we will talk about one of those initiatives, and I'm sure, you, you know, if you've ever read about it, there's a huge initiative that we, you know, HUL ran uh, over a couple of years and still running, uh, and uh, you know, to reach those women in villages. Most of the products still, you know, or a large proportion, 70 to 80 percent, get sold in ATR and BTR cities. Yeah, and that is, and that is, that constitutes in terms of population only 30 percent. 70 percent of the population still, still sits in the villages where the reach is much, much more limited. So that is why there is there is untamed you know, lot of potential sitting there, which in times is, by the way, you know, we, we are already seeing very early trends of things happening. You know, you, you know, you now have DTH connection compulsory. You just can't have a TV without a DTH connection. It's, uh, it's, it's an initiative all, all across, right? 
people are now getting into you know uh, the tv mode people are and tvs have turned very cheap as well what is the cost of a typical tv now you know, tvs used to be a luxury at some point in time so the, the media is now reaching people and those people are now becoming you know brand aware and that that further leads them to buy products and try products yeah true uh, plus the middle income group in india is also increasing at a very fast rate as gorav mentioned people from rural might uh, might be able to switching to brands now so a very simple example for example if you consider uh, one generation before most of your like grandfathers used to wash their teeth using datun which is like a product naturally available but now like i think 90% of the indian population has already switched to toothpaste so it's all about creating a need so there are so many industries which are growing at a very pa- fast pace for example packaged food so there is a need of say uh, mayonnaise all kind of spreads now increasing so unilever all can venture into those kind of uh, uh, things which are already very strong in some other country so we can leverage that and always there is a big potential to unleash in india and wherever there is a need, already established market the market is also evolving at the same time now most of the people now you will see will ha- do have very less time available with them you know they they are working almost 8 8 or 9 in the morning till 9 at night night you know uh, the you know husband and wife both are working so they don't have time to do regular chores as well at the house so they they are looking for you know buying machines because they have more income available to spend so they they will want uh, to have a sh- you know washing machine at their house subsequently there is a product need for that washing machine so there are evolving trends and then there there there, are, there is a market that is still untapped both these lead to a large large you know capital available somewhere sitting there to be extracted
hands. Absolutely. Anything else? We need specific naming of products. Well, th that was absolutely right. One of the key things that, that was a part of this video was how marketing or how communication has evolved over a period of time. And if you were to see, there was one time when it, there were purely and purely functional communications being given to consumers. And it was purely about this product does this, buy it. Versus what you saw in the 90s and 2000s era was an emotional-led communication. You, you saw that emotion was being sold to consumers to buy products. Functionality was a given. Yeah? And now what you're seeing now, which is now evolving times, is that possibly people, and especially the people living in you know, cities we, who will not possibly have time to watch TVs, will look, will look at media campaigns in, in, on Facebook, Twitter, apps. Yeah? And that is how things are evolving. And so is our way of working as well. Yeah? And so these, these are pretty much the big brands that we have, and all of them, by the way, are 1 billion euro plus brands. 1 billion euro. Anyone can tell me the number of zeros in a billion? 10 to the power 9, absolutely. And that too in euros. So multiply further by 60, 70, whatever the conversion rate right, right now is going, we can convert to INR as well. So that, that is how much, you know, the reach of these brands is. And that is the amount of, you know, you know, money it generates. At the same time, that is the consumer reach that it has, all of these brands. And uh, you will see a number, and startling number in the slide after this. Can we move to the next slide? These are the startling numbers. You want to dwell here? Yeah, yeah so, uh, so this slide gives a glimpse of how big Unilever is. So as, as you can see, it's already uh, very close to a 50 billion company. Very few companies across the globe uh, reach such kind of a, a level. Uh, if you see in terms of investment, we invest a lot of money in uh, developing new products. So we almost inv uh, invest $1 billion in our R&D. Uh, if you see the reach, we are almost in 190 countries. So out of like some, there are some 200 countries. The reach is so big, we impact almost like two to two out of three consumers every day. So every, so globally, what is the uh, uh, total population globally? Six, six billion. Okay, so out of six billion, you can see we are touching almost four billion people, which is big, huge. So guys, uh, just one thing about the size of the company, one thing which motivated me while joining. So for example, when I was in college, I was uh, of the kind of nature that uh, I want to do something good. For example, uh, if I want to do uh, a project on sustainability, uh, I thought ki HVL is a very, uh, it's a very old company. It makes soaps, oils, such kind of stuff. So what difference I could make to the society or what impact I can have on, say, sustainability on the society. So one of the things which I learned after going to Unilever was, so for example, I did a startup. I did a sustainability startup, which is helping, say, poor people. I can reach to only, say, 100 people. If it becomes very big, I can reach to, say, 1 lakh people. But while working in Unilever, even if I save a bucket of water, you imagine the amount of savings of water you can do globally. That comes about 3 trillion liters of water. 3 trillion liters of water just by saving a bucket of water. So the kind of impact you make on society is huge because of the size of the company. So this is one of the motivating factors for me for joining. So, in India also, we almost reached two, two out of three Indians, so, which is a very big number. Now, so just to tell, dwell into, you know, we've talked a lot about the products, now we'll talk about the people element here as well, and I use the word brands for people as well. HUL is known for creating brands of people. And by the way, HUL is known as talent factory. And why is it known as a talent factory? Because uh, we generate so many leaders, we generate so many business leaders that we ourselves are not able to keep them at some point in time in life. They are so good that, you know, at some point in time, we are very unhappy to leave them 
but very happy to see them head other companies. And that is what exactly has happened over a period of time. Uh, if I remember the number correctly, we close up to now closely have had, ha had CEOs uh, of some 396 multinationals, which have some point in time worked with HUL. Yeah, that's the startling number, you know, HUL claims to have. And you'll see a few of them in pictures here. Uh, in fact, I incidentally, there are a couple of people who I already have worked with in, in, in my career, limited career in New Labor over the last eight, nine years. Uh, that's Sudhanshu Watts. Uh, he heads Viacom 18. By the way, Viacom 18 has a very popular channel, absolutely colors TV. And that's Sanjeev Mehta, who heads currently HUL. We have Geetu Verma, who heads uh, the foods division. She's a you know, management committee member. Uh, we have Gopal Vittal, who heads Airtel, who again was an MC member in HUL a couple of years back. Uh, by the way, who has come back to Nestle after a while? The name is in there, so you can actually read it. This is the first time uh, Indian is his heading Nestle India. And his name is Suresh Narayan. And you know what? He is an ex ex HUL person. So from 1981 to 1997 or 99, that's what I remember, in 17, 18 years, he worked in HUL. Then finally decided at one point in time to move out, worked a couple of years in other companies, then until recently, until two months back, he was heading Philippines Nestle business as a CEO. And now after the crisis, he's been called back. And for the first time, now an Indian will head, head Nestle India business. Yeah. So just uh, after seeing these photos, I'll uh, just share a funny incident which happened with me recently. So I recently bought a Micromax TV. So I didn't get a very good service. So I thought of writing it to the CEO. So I, I was just searching who is the CEO of uh, Micromax. So it turned out to be Vineet Taneja. So I got into his LinkedIn account and uh, I saw that he's already, like he, he already worked in Unilever. So he was ex-Unilever. So like it was a little funny, but just wanted to share with you. Uh, how many of you know D. Shiv Kumar? Can we get back to the previous slide? D. Shiv Kumar. What was he doing before this job? Guys, a little bit of awareness. Newspapers. He was heading a very, very big company, which had a very, very, very bad fate ultimately. But yeah, the company w was very big. Not really. Good try. Who, who bought a mobile here in 2000s? Nokia, absolutely. He was heading India Nokia as a CEO. And then finally, he was such a good person that PepsiCo immediately hired him. Next slide. Uh, so one of the biggest elements, uh, so I talked about it uh, before as well, uh, one of the big motivators for joining Unilever is it, uh, it has a lot of focus on sustainability. So everything we do, so we keep that in mind that we are doing the things at a sustainable pace. So for example, if I am buying some kind of surfactant to make soap, which is made from a tree, say palm tree, then I make sure the sourcing I do is sustainable in nature. It is not reducing the amount of trees overall at a global level and we are replenishing it and replenishing at an equal rate. So that is one of the elements, the core elements of working in Unilever. Everything you do, everything and each and everything, literally. So we keep sustainability in mind. It's all about running a responsible company. It's all about doing the right business at the right terms. Everyone wants to earn money. Uh, in fact, I used this term you know, yesterday to to a crowd I was chatting with. Nobody does a charity. There's nothing called a free lunch. Yeah, Nobody does it, believe me. Yeah, And people who are saying this are actually lying. But at the end of the day, how do you do it matters. Everyone wants to earn money. Business is here to earn money. But at what terms? 
and do you want to earn money in a very short duration, mint a lot of money, and then collapse, do a lot, lot of wrong, versus you want to earn little by little over a lo long period of time, but doing the right thing, and then sustain that business for long. Yeah? Yes, so one of the important elements here is enhancing livelihoods. So next slide, please. There's a video here. Uh, the first time I had seen this, you know, ad, and I really felt moved, saying, you know, is this what really happens in my country, and how can I do something that can actually change this? And I think he gave the apt example here. He gave the, gave the right thing, telling that this is the extent that you can contribute. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's only about Unilever. I'm actually talking about all, all these FMCG companies here. ITC has a similar reach. In fact, I can show you the example of eChopper. I'm sure you've heard about it. It's touching so many people. He's doing so so good work somewhere there, yeah. And equally, other companies, Racket Bank, Kaiser. You talk about Nestle. You talk about other companies. All of them have some social initiative somewhere, and they are trying to change lives or impact lives. Yeah. True. Just talking more about this uh, Lifeway program. So uh, we uh, every year we declare one holiday, and all the employees in Unilever, we go out. Uh, we teach students how to uh, wash hands. And we do a little bit promotion of LiveWire as well. Uh, so it's a fact. So every year, like uh, below five, there is a very high mortality rate uh, amongst the uh, children, which is very high in villages where the hygiene conditions are not good and the reach of, uh, say, soaps, hand wash uh, things are not available. 
so it made a big impact and this is one of the true stories from one of the villages which we have shown you and and the, this is correct and every year october 15th is the date where you know actually hul does this initiative uh, each one of the employees is expected actually to go and do some good work in some school you know try and teach a class for an hour tell them the benefits of doing something washing their hands and how it can impact their life you've seen the can we go to the previous slide the previous slide essentially about, about the other initiative and i'm sure again you must have heard about is called uh, some some initiative called shakti amma and now you know it's been extended to shakti man as well and uh, the whole initiative is about empower, empowering women and especially the village women and this is how the opportunities get linked to you know the right behavior and the right thing that you want to do uh, you know you for so many years we've seen there's there's been a lot of women oppression and uh, you know so women in villages you know have been very confined to houses and they've not been able to you know have their own sustained future they've not been able to sustain themselves and they've been dependent on someone uh, this is one initiative actually that brings you know uh, an end to that and what how how do we do this is where uh, what we do is we essentially go to you know uh, anganwadis and essentially meet women village women mm -hmm. and these village women essentially become our ambassadors and a few of them actually become shakti ammas and these shakti ammas then go house by house they try sell products and they earn a livelihood for themselves and this is this is where how we try and reach villages where it is very difficult to reach so there is an opportunity for us and our products to reach however we, at the same time we are empowering women we are actually giving them more employment and one women who gets empowered can impact much much more than you know 100 men getting empowered because that women essentially is going to change the future she, she herself will get get educated he, she will have you know some more education being imparted to children she you know she'll be independent yeah see uh, one of the things good things here is every model which we build on it's it's like co dependent so for example if i want to do charity i can give someone 1 crore rupees i can give a village 1 crore rupees i can develop it and that's all but the kind of models which unilever look for are co dependent for example we are helping the lady to get the job and she is helping us to reach the villages so that is also one and of the values is very sustainable because to tomorrow if the business is not running well the business may not have money to do give away to charity however in this model the business will have a lot of money and at the same time the system and the engine will keep on running now a bit before we go ahead what uh, you know there was this question about what we do you know in in natural and you know unilever so i essentially well uh, i don't know if you remember my name as well i am gorav pathak and uh, typically in, uh, when i was in first year somebody would have said kolo so on right right now i'll try and open, you know kolo here so i essentially uh, am a global project leader though though my designation says that i am a senior development manager i'm essentially a global project leader for a brand called radiant and uh, this brand radiant is uh, in india incidentally is called the rin brand so you've seen rin products rin powder rin bar rin supreme or all those brand products they essentially are uh, you know i'm essentially responsible for the technical you know bit for that brand so there's uh, this marketing bit and then there's this innovation bit so i essentially lead the entire innovation bit for radiant brand globally uh, that's part one of my responsibility the part two of my responsibility essentially starts with that number and that is why i was so up with that number of water saving that we are doing i essentially am responsible for saving water for unilever through its products and uh, you know again i am essentially responsible for that one bucket of water getting saved through each of our product that gets used in home care you know category and eventually then leading to 3 trillion liters of water being saved for the planet yeah however there's subsequent benefit that comes across so when when you know women save water during you know when they use our product they essentially save time as well so when they they are to save 3 trillion liters of water they essentially will be saving 1 billion man hours or women hours as well and that will essentially go to the next generation because that mother will have more time to spend with their children and you know take them for a better future so talking about my role i i work in gorav's team only so it's very closely related 
So I work in laundry category and I'm responsible for launching new products. So just to give you an example, uh, just take an example of Surf Excel in India. So when it would have been first launched, so someone, some technical person would have decided how the packaging will look like, what actually you will put inside the product as ingredients, how will you make that product, what kind of processing route you will follow to make that product, and finally how you will scale up that particular product. So all those technical bits, uh, so we, we design. So we have like teams uh, within the group. For example, we will have a formulation team, we will have a packaging team, we will have a consumer insights team. So we coordinate all those teams to launch a final product into the market. So that's the kind of job I do. And essentially we are responsible for that product we launch and launch as well. And we are responsible for that product from cradle to you know grave. And when I say cradle to grave, it means basically from you know, buying of those raw materials required to make that product till the time they are used and then finally disposed of by the consumer. So we are responsible for each and every element around them, how they are used. Is there any bit of safety concern associated with any product? All those elements we have to take care of. Yeah. And this is how, you know, this is basically the motto we, we operate. And uh, for, if you were to ask any Unilever person what is kind of motto they operate, it's for us, consumer is the king. And we will do everything that is in right spirit and in the right need. Uh, we will do everything responsibly and with utmost integrity for that consumer. Develop products which, are, which make their life more convenient and you know, basically help them. Uh, yeah, so let me talk about the UFLP program. So as you guys know, uh, uh, my name is Tushar. I joined in 2012 as a management trainee. So there is a very famous program in Unilever, which uh, you might be, uh, you will be learning uh, about that. So it is known as Unilever Future Leader Program. Uh, so there are many, many categories uh, in which we run this program. So basically from ITs, we recruit people for two roles. One is supply chain and the other one is R&D. So these two profiles we recruit from IT Kanpur. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, so telling about the program, so the major key highlights of the program are, so it's a one and a half year kind of training. So it's a very rigorous training where you will get to know about different segments of business. So for example, if I, I, I was recruited as an R&D BLT, I learned about how does the marketing function? How does the finance function? So it gives a holistic overview of, uh, of the company, how it runs, how it functions. It's a very renowned global program. So we recruit from each and every country. It's not only uh, like it is in India. So it's very well known in uh, all the uh, good MBA colleges. Apart from that... Uh, one uh, element that is essentially happens further is there is a lot of cross transfer of employees that happens across different different sub-organizations in Unilever as well. So while Unilever is the mother brand and mother company, each and every company has the, uh, each and every country has its own unique setup. And there's a lot of cross, cross, uh, transfer of talent that happens between countries. So many of these UFLP, you know, candidates, they essentially go to different countries for work there. Many senior managers, many directors essentially go and travel, you know, to other countries. Sometimes, you know, on a multi-year basis, three years, four years, sometimes for permanently they actually move to different countries and then start operating businesses, heading businesses altogether. True, and uh, the other key highlight for the program is the international exposure. So for example, uh, during the 18 months of training, you will have an international stint where you will be placed outside India for six weeks and you will get to know the culture, uh, the ways of working of that particular country. So it is quite useful. Uh, the other key highlight would be, uh, there is a program uh, uh, at I am Bangalore. So uh, you, you live in I am Bangalore, you do all the crash courses there. So that is also uh, quite known. Apart from that, there is a particular stint, rural stint, where you get to know how do the people uh, behave in a rural environment. You, you live there, you actually live there. So just to share an experience, I lived in a village called Purushwadi. So you actually live with the villagers in their huts. You eat what they eat. You have the daily routine very similar to them. So you actually get to know how does rural India functions. So it's very insight, insightful stint. And it's also being followed by some other banks and companies which want to venture into rural uh, camps.
this is pretty much we had from our side. Now, I, I, what I want to ask you is, do you have a zeal enough when you to see one more video? And that's a pretty long video, so let me caution you. It's almost about eight, nine minutes of a video. I found it very interesting, but I don't know if you guys want to, or you have that, you know, thing in you still left after this, yeah. whatever two sessions we've so, had. So Gaurav, I think, uh, let's not play the video. Uh, in case you have any questions, we can answer those. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Don't play, don't play. So, uh, see, uh, so good question. So, so there's, there's a strategy behind the whole production bit. So, uh, you need, at the way Unilever operates, we have very premium brands, then we have mid -seg segment brands, and then we have very low tier brands, so to say. And then, uh, how do, how are these brands then sub sub quantified or you know sub classified? Is in terms of commodities, specialized commodities, and then there are specialities, yeah, and. Obviously, if there is a speciality, you would want to earn a premium because nobody else is able to do that. Yeah. Now, wherever there is an IP involved, wherever there is a speciality involved, it typically needs Unilever to manufacture it. So to say, in, you know, to safeguard the IP associated to that. For example, I can tell you a product like Dove, Dove Soap. Now, Dove Soap is a, is, is a product which nobody understands the technology apart from what Unilever does. And that is why nobody has been able, able to replicate it either as well. So that is a kind of product which would require only Unilever to manufacture it and basically be accountable for all the product manufacturing and including the IP bit as well. However, then there are products which are very commoditized, which are, which are very routine, but have only some specialities associated where we feel that the IP associated is not that strong that we will need to invest the capital to manufacture that product as well. So that is where we essentially try and outsource those products. So typically, for example, I were to give an example, a wheel product of ours. We'll, we'll, some of our manufacturing sites which have some production capacity left over will manufacture wheel, but a large, large part of the wheel mm, mm, portfolio is outsourced right now. One of the key reasons of, again, outsourcing is associated with lower tier products as well. Because wherever the product cost is so small, we would want to save on the logistics cost as well, because log logistics typically is a very expensive bit in the overall scheme of things. So we would want to manufacture the product very close to the consumer, so that the logistics co cost is as minimal as possible. So wheel is one such product which is like actually manufactured closer to consumer. However, a specialized product, you know, like for example, Surf XL or a Dove, is actually manufactured sometimes away from the consumer, but we are happy to pay for that logistics cost because we want to save the IP associated. Yeah, was I clear in my answer? Any any other questions? Essentially, uh, design is a philosophy. Uh, the way I see it, it's, it's no longer associated now, at least in the new scheme of things, associated to products or you know the way you do things. It's all about how you impart design to elements. And you're correct. It, it, you know the basic elements that come to our mind are essentially in the communication bit and the pro product bit. And product itself is something that is physical more so. And then now the new bits around the you know the software bit as well, where there is a lot of design involved. Um, we, ha we employ a lot of design in terms of, especially the, you know, the hardware bit. For example, if you, I, w I can give you an example, is all this pureed business. Yeah, the pureed business makes a lot of water purifiers now. And all of them require a very big element around design. And uh, for that, we have some people who ha we have directly recruited with us. Uh, those are more like spe specialized, you know, you know, experts of sorts. Uh, however, then there are these people then sublet some some you know some of their work to w design agencies, and one of these companies could be, for example, Tata Electric that comes to my mind, and other companies where then they will subdo the work of design and then come back to us. Yeah. 
so uh, just to answer your question program. i think well, we have a very good program with iit kanpur as well in the design in fact a couple of years back we ran a whole uh, uh, campaign here uh, there is this whole uh, you know i don't know what, what, what was that uh, do you remember the bit around Which one? The, the design contest contest we had run uh, in the design uh, with the design team here in iit kanpur yeah so every year we take few interns and we do come to iit kanpur as well but uh, uh, just to answer your question so uh, in unilever it's a outsource function so we don't uh, develop talent by taking people from m design so it's like uh, we hire only experts so if we have a particular problem we will just give it to an expert to get it solved so it's not a integral function it's outsourced in terms of branding see we have a lot of people who are in which ways you know so to say good marketers you know essentially they they lead the whole marketing bit around uh, we ha we we do speak to a lot of design people outside to guide us and they you know you, you know you've known the pralats of the world who actually lead you know lead and help almost every other company who is very good at branding yeah so there are lots of experts and companies that sit and guide us you know when we we go and speak to them and tell us tell our proposition however the core proposition has to come from us you know the definition of the problem has to be clear enough for someone else to come and you know then help us around anything else guys is that yeah. it so i think uh, yeah i think that's all so thank you guys for coming here any any and any of you carrying eggs and tomatoes please throw at him <laughs> so thank you guys for coming here and best of luck for the placements all right abhi i here you you know i'm here until tomorrow morning early very early morning so if anyone want of you wants to talk to me after the session as well i'm very much here all right thanks